Hello and welcome to Flory Models. Here we are on Tall Tuesday, the 15th of December 2020. Busy morning to be honest. I've been working on the gun deck area for the actual turret on the top of the MRAP here. It's come together very, very nicely. It's somewhat looking the box. There's a lot of photo etched down in there and all the bits and pieces that go along with it. Light is definitely at the end of the tunnel. So I intend to get that painted this afternoon. Once that's painted, we can then just do the spare wheel holder and we've got the sort of A-frame for the tow bar on the front to do. We've got to do a little bit with the wheels and everything else like that, but we are pretty much there. So then it will just be a case of final painting. I know it looks painted, but I've sort of done it in subsections, so it will get another coat right the way over just to finish that one off. And then we'll be into weathering. So hopefully by the end of the week, we should be pretty much there. Then it's going to be handed off to Matt. And then next year, Matt is going to put some figures to it. We're going to do a diorama base for it, so forth and so on. So it is a little bit of a co-ab build between me and Matt on this particular one but generally it is looking very very nice I say we don't know how we're gonna have it positioned yet I'd like to have it with the bonnet open to show off obviously all the engine in there and stuff like that but we will see about that when Matt comes to doing his little bit with it but so far so good I'm running out of time because I haven't even started it yet to actually get on with the Ravel uh, Star Trek Enterprise I am going to do it next, but obviously it might fall into next year. I wanted to get it done this year and fully done. It's all there. The bowcaster, and to be honest, my rubber hose, this little guy, has arrived now, which we're waiting on. I've got my paracord here all ready to go as well for adding the details onto the bowcaster. So before the end of the year, that one will be done as well. But the reason we got this is because this is actually highly, highly strong elastic. Um, and uh, they use it in slingshots and catapults and stuff like that. But it's great because this means it can go onto this one. It will be the cord coming across the actual bowline pole and all the rest of it. And again, it's got some movement in it because it's resin, don't want it to be rock hard because one knock it will break. So uh, this way, being a little bit stretchy like this, it'll be good to go. So that's arrived this morning, so that's good. So we can actually just wait in for the D-rings to turn up for that one, for the clips and all the various bits. As soon as they arrive, which I don't know, even know why they're not here. They should have been here literally weeks ago. Um, but hopefully they'll be up now and we can get that finished off as well. So literally we're into those final stages. We literally got two weeks to get everything done now. So uh, I'm trying to get this all done as fast as possible without rushing it, if that makes sense, to make our way through. But anyway, MRAP's coming along very, very nicely. You might have seen yesterday, what have I done with it? I've moved it, here it is, sorry. Uh, we did have uh, the review for this little guy up there as well. So if you haven't seen it already, this is for the no section of a 30 second scale Lancaster beautiful work. A couple of people mentioned about um, cracks in the plastic. It's not. It's actually um, a line. I think the like, camera makes it look like a crack, but it's not. It's actually the, the where the canopy fits onto it. It looks like it's a crack, but it's not. Uh, it's fine and all the rest of it. Any scratches on that may be me, so who knows. But anyway, it's probably one of the clearest bits of injection moulding I've seen in a long time. So kudos, obviously, to HK Models for doing it so well and not putting all the god-awful frames and everything in there. In other words, not just pinching a fuselage section and just doing it in clear, which is what a lot of them do. So anyway, that is up with you right now. And to be honest with you, I have done this morning, although I haven't edited it yet, is the actual F4 Phantom. So the F4 Phantom, obviously the Zukamori kit is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. That's ready to come up with you tomorrow as we make our way through. Anyway, it is Q&A day, but first of all, we're bringing back sort of Tool Tuesday. So we've got some tools to look at, and then afterwards we'll go with your questions uh, from this week, okay? Okay, so what I intend to do next year is obviously bring back Tool Tuesday. So down in front of us, we've got uh, something to kick us off for the year. To be honest, I've had these for a long time, but just haven't had time to get down and actually have a look and review them. So what have we got? This is all Master Tools, which is part of Trumpeter. What they do is, is that they actually release to be honest, quite a good range of tools. They're not massively expensive. They tend to be on the cheaper side of things, but you often think of Chinese stuff as being cheap and nasty and low quality. This isn't the highest quality, but it's definitely not the worst, okay? And I think for, you know, bang for your buck and all the rest of it, and for somebody who's more the casual modeler, then definitely it's well worth having a look at these. So anyway, what we've got in front of us is uh, a few things. So we've got this one here, which is new in, to be honest. Uh, and this is a razor saw. So it's photo etched down in here and it's in plastic. We'll have a good look at that in a moment. We've got down in here a micro rivet punch set. And as you know, a lot of people will have got a very expensive version of this one. But this is obviously a more cheaper, affordable one of that one. So we'll have a go with on Buster with that in a minute. And also a lot is said about nippers and single blade cutters and as you know here they are um, take your pick I've got extremely expensive godhand ones 
which are probably looking at in the UK anywhere between 60 and 90 pounds. I've heard people pay for them. I've got some display ones, which we really like the look of as well. They're very nice. And I've got some of the uh, Mr. Hobby ones, which again, I quite like them. They're very nice as well. The big thing with these ones is that they're all single bladed ones. So you just have one flat block and a blade comes in and cut it. Now I've done reviews on these types of tools before. There's lots of them out there, but I thought it'd be worth having a look at these because they're a lot cheaper than anybody else's that are out there. So anyway, let's start off with this one over here. So this is the uh, cutting blade set. So basically what it is, is a photo etch razor saw, but you get a couple of bits of plastic to put it all together. So you get one of these and in here which is all in one we actually get these so start off with we need to cut our way in so let's just nip our way in here so we've got type a we've got type b c and d okay and then in here we have them in so we just cut these in very similar and um, there's also reviews up there what i'll do is i'll link this all below okay to the other reviews on similar products so perhaps you can do a side-by-side -side comparison if i could get this out of here even there we go it's because it's covered in plastic all right so what we've got in here is each of the blades and i say i don't know how well the camera is going to show it as in how you can see the teeth but again they don't look too bad at all so what i'm trying to do is is get into or under shall we say the plastic because again this is one of those ones where you want to keep the tool as flat as possible okay and i'm trying to show you at the same time which is never easy okay so what you've got is these okay and again they look pretty good they're quite thin all right right the way through so what we can do is sorry mr emma i need to borrow you a second we'll just take these off of the, the sprues so I literally do it this way. You might do it a different way. These are actually quite large sprue tabs. Okay, I think that's them off. Again, they're not the thinnest ones ever, shall we say, but they're off. Okay, that's a very, very fine blade. Okay, so we've got those there. And then if we just take these off, that's one there and one there. And one not. Okay, same thing. Hopefully, then this will just peel off. And again, you can wiggle it. The blades themselves don't feel as sharp, shall we say, as some of the others, like the Tamiya ones we've dealt with before. Okay, let's get this one off. To be honest, I'm going to. Sorry, we're going the wrong way, aren't we? That's why. I'm trying to do it with the plastic so we haven't got to take both sides off. And then last of all, we've got this little guy in here. Okay, let me go down. And then hopefully he comes out. So that's all your parts removed then from the fret. Okay, so you can lose that. And then what we've got here is these. Okay, so. <clears throat> what we're going to do is we'll just remove these from the sprue we'll keep this screw back in a moment for our show and tell on the next section so to start with we've got this one so we're assuming this is the uh, number a which i think you can sort of use pretty much a or b for these so what you've got is a situation was so it's this one yeah that's just going to fit in here so again it's got a nice good solid block but again you don't want to be bending this too much okay that seems to be in there and then we can just pop both halves wedging it together and you could probably glue it for a, a nicer feel and all the rest of it it's a little bit wibbly wobbly but as in cutting wise buster you're up okay we have a quick go perhaps just in here oh that's actually quite a nice cut okay i'll take it all back so if you was to be To be honest, that is a beautiful cut. 
Um, I might sound surprised. I shouldn't, <laughs> being biased, but that's actually, to be honest, a very, very nice cut. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. It's very, very fine. It's a lot finer, shall we say, toothed than the Tamiya one. You might know, and, you know, as you say, separate review completely. I'm not going to get confused. This is the Tamiya type of version. Say They do different blades in it. I just have the hooked one in this one. But you feel the blades. I can feel the blades. They're in there. This particular one, you can't really. They are very, very fine. But generally, I say, I don't really want to start cutting Buster into small sections, but they do go in very nicely. And again, it seems... Very, very nice indeed. So actually, I don't think that's as bad as I thought it would be. It just looks quite cheap and gnarly, but the blade itself does the trick fantastically well. Okay, so that's that one. Let's have a go with another one. So let's try this one here. Okay. So this here, get around the right way, is this one. Does it have an up and down? I don't think it matters. And again, it's one of those things. They're very, very tight to get in. Okay, and then that's on there like that. So again, you've got this nice little tool like this now. You could glue it together. Okay, let's have another go. But don't forget, this is technically like a razor saw. And it's got a nice little point in it, but okay, that's the only thing. You get to that thing and it's so thin, it bends. Okay, now that's a little bit of user error on my part rather than anything else. But if you were coming in here, okay, it would be absolutely fine. And again, it's purely because we're trying to probably cut something a little bit too much that it's designed for, but hey ho. But hopefully you can see how thin the line is. Okay, so that's that one there. Then we've got, what have we got, A and B. I think that's just the side things for it. Okay, let's just cut this, A and B. Okay, I'm just wondering what this other thing is on here. Does it say? doesn't say. Need more instructions. Oh, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Look, read the instructions, Flory. Note to self. So it's saying about deburring these off and all the rest of it. So now we're in these. The one I want to know, oh, it's this one. Ah, got you. Right, okay. That makes really good sense now. Okay, so what we need is this bit. Okay, now we understand what's going on okay so if we just take this one here he does fit up in there and then we can take the V side of it okay and that's quite a nice tool as well because it, it's one of those you sort of roll in so then what we're guessing is you can take said A and B's and put them in here and you can use this as a jig for rubbing the stuff up and down it. So if you wanted to take, he says desperately looking for something to cut in half here. Um, um. Something like this is just a, an old bit of resin here, but you can place this on here now and you can use it to keep it flat yeah, yeah and then you can rotate it around to give you a a perfectly flat not that this is going to cut it but hopefully you'll see the line finish you okay, just keep going all the way around and we have look we've gone all the way around with it so that's actually not bad at all. So the last one up, let me just grab this last one. A and B. Okay, let's just grab these as well. Now these I assume are height guides. Okay, let's just pop 
this one in here. And there is a left and a right to it as well, which no, there's not. Okay, I'm missing something here. Hold on, I think we put B and A and A and B. Hold on, let me just get this off of here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, note to self. Yes, right, okay. I think what we've done, we've put this one in the other one. We want this one and this one. There we go. That's better. Okay, and this one goes to B and B. One assumes that's it. I think this one wants to come in here. There we go, look. Look, I'm a bloke, I don't read instructions. You know what it's like? I'm not the only one here. Okay, so with this one, I assume what you can do is you can put this down and actually bring up the height a little bit if you wanted to. And I assume on this one, you can, yeah, you can probably change things around and all the things to it as well. So in here, you can put this one on here. Let's try a different way. And then, actually, it's something so simple. It actually works. That's the weird thing to this. Let's zip around here. Okay, but there we go. That's about taking off the differences in these by using this little lethal thing. And again, we can get it off without cutting our fingers off. That's actually how that works. So that's quite nice. So if you were coming in, instead of trying to second guess this and work your way around it, you've got that option to come in. And again, you can do the height bars. So by using the instructions, which is highly recommended, you can see how you can take this up by six mil, okay? Or by five mil, and then changing the height things by putting on these different ones onto here like this. So again, by reading the instructions now, you can actually say, okay, we want to bring up the bottom. And if we were doing it this way, this would be bringing it up by uh, two mil onto the bottom side. And then you can place this in, you can place this one onto here. Okay, and then that way, once you come in, you can do lots of different heights and various things. Okay, what can I say? I'm a bloke, I don't read. Okay, but you can change the height on them just like that. Now, they are, the only thing I will say, very thin, which in some ways is a double-edged sword with this because whilst they're thin, it means it means for a very, very fine cut, you're not taking much material. So if you want to change things out and everything else, then yeah, absolutely, that's a great way of doing it. The downside is they flex, okay, which might mean they need a little bit more carbon in the alley for this, but it does quite work quite well. So obviously, if you're taking, you know, and you've got one of these tear shaped cuts like this, the great thing is with this one, you can come in and you can work in lines. So hopefully, you can see, you can put in replacement panel lines. So if you wanted them very, very thin, you can just come in. And again, I do this reverse rock thing, literally like that. And then you could, if you wanted to, literally come in. Let's try and follow a panel line. So we've got a panel line here. Okay, and you can use it as a push motion. Okay, and you can put the panel lines in, in a push motion which is, I think, if you're like me, uh, I've sort of got very much into doing this push business rather than dragging, because I find dragging, you end up going everywhere. But if you were putting it down, for instance, and we were doing this type of thing, we wanted to put in a new panel line, you can just come in and you can push. And because you've got a tail on it, you can literally, it's like a swooshing motion, like that. And you can pop your panel lines in right the way across. So let's assume we wanted to put one in here to follow this one right the way through. And because it's got a very, very fine edge on it, you can put in a very, very nice panel line. So let's assume you're coming in here. Okay, you can start your panel line and then you walk your way along and then you drag the back end of the panel across. 
So it's almost like a tier. So you're using the front of the blade and then you can just walk the rest of it, it gives you the depth on the other side, which is easier sometimes than doing a front one when you're coming in like this and you're trying to walk a panel line right the way across as well. Okay, but again, all of them have got their own little places for this. Probably not this guy, to be honest, he's far too flexible, but this one's quite nice as well. Some of them work on a pull, some of them work on a push, so it's just working your way around on which one you wanted to do. But yes, definitely one of those ones where I think you play with it, you get a bit of an idea for it. I do like this business of popping it in the little holder here, and you can just come in like this and then just cut your way right the way through. Now, I don't know how long these would last. I don't know how sharp they'll stay, but doing it for small jobs, I think you'd be absolutely fine, you know? Again, I use these ones, and these have a certain amount of flex to them as well, so don't think that I'm just bashing them, because the Tamiya ones are just as guilty. And again, I've got the curve one down in here. But the big thing is, one, the Tamiya ones are a lot more expensive. Secondly, you don't get a holder. So from Tamiya's point of view, what they do is give you this, and this is photo etch, and you bend it all around yourself, as I say, the other review is down under this one, to make the blade. But you don't get a proper holder. So what you need to do is come up with your own holder then, and then you can literally come in, if I can get this thing back in here now. Okay, and you can, you have to put in your own holder to get this guy back into. And again, so he goes in there, and then once it's in, you can screw it up and you're good to go. With these ones, straight out of the box, you've got it. Now they do seem a little bit plasticky and they don't seem to be the best thing, but the blade themselves actually is a very, very fine blade. And again, I don't know how well you can even see the teeth on that. They are extremely fine, all of them. But they do work. They do do the job, and that's the thing to it. So again, it's one of those things that first impressions, a little bit of orange plastic and a little very thin piece of metal into it, you're thinking that's just cheap and gnarly. But actually, it does work, so I'll give it its that. As I said, how long it lasts, I don't know. Okay, but it definitely seems to do the trick. But again, if you have read the instructions before me, you can see they do go through, talks about cleaning them up, putting the blades in there, and then obviously this little block one as well for doing slices out of stuff. You can see it on there just like that and it will teach you all about it. But yeah, I have to say for its price, which is £8.50, £8.50. It is available from the PM store, as you can see here. And uh, yes, that's, that's what it is. So your part number for this one is 09917 just like that but yeah i think generally that's not too bad is it at the end of the day right okay up next we've got this little guy so this is the micro riveting punch set now you might know there's a few places around the world which do these and they're incredibly expensive so it's interesting to see a cheaper version okay so as you can see down in here you get a little thing and again, normally you get a wooden punch handle, and then we've got these. And to be honest, mine's rusty, and it's got a few problems in here, okay? But looking on here, you can see some of the directions. You basically place each one up in the handle, turn by turn, and then obviously you've got guides, and you can do these. Now, the whole point of these ones versus other people's is normally they are recessed, okay? But these ones are actually domed. So I'm going to use the biggest one just because it's probably easier to see. How the hell this ever fits in a handle is beyond me. Oh, it does go. Okay. Do you know what? I thought that wasn't going to go, purely because I'm used to the wooden ones. But what we will do is we have here a very nice... Buster 2, as he's now known, okay? So normally when you come in, you put these in and you put them in, you give them a little bit of a twist, okay? And then hopefully you can see you get a domed type rivet. I'll tell you what, let me use a slightly smaller one because pushing in massive ones is quite tricky. Okay, so that's a 22 or 2.2 mil, okay? So let's try this in here. And we come in and you push you wiggle and then what you're left with hopefully you can see is a domed rivet and then what you can do you can come along now obviously this is huge on something of this scale but you get the effect if i use a smaller one again let's go for something tiny they are all sized as well and you've got different types of dome the handle works really really well actually okay 
So not only is it, it looks like on camera, it's just making a, a various thing. But hopefully you can see now, when you give it a proper push in, it actually gives you a dome right the way in. So if you wanted to do slightly raised dome rivets, this is how you do it. And again, it's got a dot in the middle even, which I don't know if it's a casting mark or if it's something in there, but you can just give it a wiggle and then it comes up. Again, probably not the best thing. It's a bit like telly. That's coming with a smaller one. The handle, I have to say, works really well. It goes in and it grips it. It doesn't come out. It's, I don't know if there's a magnet in there or something, but perhaps not. But it does seem to hold its own in there. Okay, now if we come along next to this. So if you use a ruler, you can come along and do domed rivets. So if you were doing armor, for instance, you can see them. We're getting sort of smaller. I know we're getting very, very small in here. But that's the point to them. So hopefully you can see on here, on the heads, they are actually domed. And you've got different shaped ones on here right the way through and it looks like i'm going to grab my magnifiers myself to see these yes they are all right the way domed every single one of these okay right the way round. so you're going from you have got to see here for a one two three they're not in sizing of millimeters but hopefully you can see these the way that they sort of come round. So if you wanted to do Rome divot, uh, rivets, but also the thing is with these, if you don't think of them as just doing dome rivets, obviously arm is probably where you're gonna be using these a lot more than you are an aircraft. But also if you're doing things like uh, latches and stuff like that, you can use these. So perhaps if you've done a row of rivets, so let's just make an example here. Down in here, right? So we're just assuming, and we're making this up now, but we're just gonna put in a row of rivets Okay, so you've just got a row of rivets and then you wanted to put in like a latch or something or a catch or something else like that. So what you can do is just come up with this one. Okay, and then you can literally say, okay, well, we'll have the latch just underneath. So we'll push it right into the wing and that gives you a latch mark and then perhaps another one next to it. You can see. And that's how you'll work it. So you've got low rivets and then latch marks and then you'd have a panel line that it'll look like you've actually got an access. So this little guy down in here, for instance, you might notice we've got one each side. What I'm gonna do is we'll try and do this somewhat professionally. Okay, we're gonna add a bit of detail to this one in here. So again, we're just gonna come in. So now you've actually got, instead of it just being a circle, we've now got a domed or a pressed stud or something in there on here so let's go with the other one and that's in there just like that okay so it's just an extra dimension of detail put in so there we go we'll go with one in here and we'll put one just down in here and then another one just along here and one just perhaps down in here and one on the end Okay, and that's how we're adding just a little bit more detail into your life. Okay, so whilst I wouldn't recommend going around doing everything is in a dome rivet, although reality is some of them are, if you did want to add a little bit more into an area, or perhaps you've got some raised riveting and you want to replace some of it, then you can come in with some of these and then just pop them around in that certain area. I don't think I'd ever go around doing an entire thing of entirely raised, but if you wanted to, you could do. And one little trick for doing it is, if I can find mine, if you grab a saw blade, I'm just trying to think of one we've got here, that's probably too fine, if I can find a a heavier saw blade, which I don't think I can. Here we go, that's just, for argument's sake, I've got some here, but if you use jigsaw blades, and you know what I mean by a jigsaw, what you can do, you can place these on an area, you can then come along to a tooth, you feel where a tooth is, and you just give it a push, and then you can move along, count one, two, three, one, two, three, and you just work your way along 
and you can put then the rivets at equal distances all the way through. But if you use a jigsaw blade, you can just go along, go one, two, three. So the little fine jigsaw blades you get from power tools, old ones of those, keep them because they're great for doing that type of work. Used it a lot in the past, okay? But that way you get equal distances. And what you can do is use a Sharpie on the jigsaw blade and mark your distances you want each one to be. But you just go into the recess of the blade, not the tooth that's pointing out, but the recess. Go one there, one there one there and obviously if you get some of the ripper blades they're very far apart and the finer ones get finer but jigsaw blades are great for doing that type of thing as well again i have got these fine ones here which are sort of designed for it and again you can then count you go one and then one two and then go one two and you can just go along and put them in as you make your way along literally like that and that will put in your your ones if you want to anyway there we go raised punch set looks to be i have to say one of those tools which again you can pay a hell of a lot of money for these but if we have a look at the store page again we are doing these currently for a major oops sorry it's jumped back a measly uh 15.99 okay that's the one you want 15.99 you've got it down in there as well again there is other versions of this available it does sit in there literally like that okay and then you pop your top on and it holds it in there i have got i'll be honest with you other ones and we've shown and used them before and they come with these okay and they are loose and you have to wedge these back in and they're a pain because once they're in there they don't like to come out again but these are exactly the same these are just a handful of my usual ones that i use for it the other thing you might notice is the handle is i'll be honest with you pretty much the same but this is great because it literally just comes in and you can take it out and you can change over these ones i can assure you will never come out again they are in there i've used a little bit of water in there to seal those in there because they kept falling out so again i'm not going to say forever it will hold its own but it seems to be very nice but again it's quite comfortable because these once they're in take the rusty one as you can see there's quite a long distance in the end of it so i find this one to be if i'm honest with you when you're holding it in your hand it's too long to get in there but this one actually i think that's quite a let's pick that in that's actually about the right distance because you're from the end to your finger is about there but this one you have to stretch your finger right out otherwise you'd be about here and i find that's a little bit off so i like to guide things with my finger so from a comfortable point of view i actually prefer this one to over the wooden one but again this one you click I can change out my one and away we go. These, I have these fixed in because, again, these are my two normal sizes that I use for most things. And again, it works exactly the same way. You know, there is no difference, I think, in using these and using any of the others. But again, just depends on personal choice. But I think really for the money, when you're talking, as I say, 16 pounds, it's one of those tools. Probably you're not gonna use it every time, but it's cheaper than other alternatives out there. And for the amount of times perhaps you use a tool, cheaper may be better than expensive as you make your way through. So anyway, there we go, that's the tool holder. I do like that one, that's very nice indeed. Okay, last up, and probably, probably one of the most controversial things is side cutters. Because again, I have got these. These are my God hands ones. They're very, very expensive. They are beautiful. They do the job and everything else like that. And if you're doing fine bits, honestly, they're a, a life changer. Uh, you know, a lifesaver, a life changer, both. Um, obviously, if you're using certain plastics, clear plastics is too hard for them. Bandai plastics can be too hard for them. And you end up taking chunks and blades out. They are designed as a professional finishing tool rather than hacking through certain kit manufacturers shall we say mac 2 looking at you but the great thing about them is when you cut off parts with them and we'll do a demo on here they are extremely close and then again you get other ones slightly cheaper these are the display ones they're very good as well and they leave just a little bit of plastic so what do we mean by that it means you've got hardly any cleanup You've got to go around afterwards with a knife or with a sander and clean up the parts afterwards because they are that close, you're pretty much there. So these ones are obviously a single blade nipper. You can see the thing about it here and all the rest of it. Okay, do not use on electrical stuff. 
So I haven't used these before. This is the first time they've literally come out of it. But the way it works, you can probably see down in here, you have one blade and a block. So think of it as a block and one blade comes across and cuts. If you use one that's two blades coming in, what happens is they cause pressure and it snaps the part out. It's physically the pressure coming in that does it. The easiest way you can see is the white mark it leaves behind and that's what it is which is pinging out, which I will show you. So. Uh, let me just grab a piece of sprue. Okay, so you can probably hear and see it there. This is a pair of Citadel cutters, which are just two blades coming together and they do the end like this. Okay, so that just took off and went right the way over the other side of the studio. Okay, if you look at down on this, you can see the white of the cutting right there. Now, if we try it with one of the master tool cutters here, when you come along, first time we've ever cut for this, you come in, you can probably see. One, there's no white mark. Secondly, that did not fly off. It's a very nice, smooth cut right the way across. So when you cut it, it's got one blade. This is the blocking side, this is the blade. The blade comes across and it just shears off, as you can see here, a very nice piece of plastic. And that's the nice thing to it. All right, so if we just put it up against uh, some of the others, so this is the uh, Citadel ones, and again, very, very nice. It's come across, nice, beautiful, clean cut, and then again, it's probably a bit much for God hands, but oh, hopefully they won't break. It goes through, and I'll be honest with you, you probably heard that chink. That's the thing, the God hand ones is a very fine blade. It just goes through everything. It's literally like, you know, knife through butter. It's very, very nice, but that's the God hands ones to it. The big thing is, is how well does it attack plastic, okay? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna place it on here. So all you do, you put it down, you place, you come across, and then you cut, okay? And then we're gonna do exactly the same on the other side. Okay, we're gonna come in here and we're going to cut. And the big thing is, is the amount you've got left on this edge. And as you can see, there's a very small amount but it's very nice. You can probably see there isn't much on there at all. So your cleanup is almost non-existent. So if we put that up against just a pair of God hands doing the same thing exactly. Okay, so we just come in and then we get cut. We place it down, we get cut. The difference literally in these is how much is left behind. You can probably not even really see it. It is absolutely non-existent basically and on the other side you can see that there's literally nothing left behind you catch it in the light that's the sprue tab just there but when you look at it you can see there's hardly anything there whatsoever so when you look at other ones you can see there's a little bit of a tab there there's a little bit of a tab on that one okay but i have to say when you're putting them up against obviously very expensive stuff so that's just stick them up against a hobby boss ones okay so let's just pop it in here and we're going to cut and again we're just going to cut okay so this is the hobby boss ones we'll look at them afterwards let's move all those out of the way and then this is exactly the same thing so we're just going to come along now with our trusty new ones which to be honest are cutting perfectly well okay and then forget the god hands ones because they're just stupidly expensive okay let's stick them up against a pair of display cutters now that's those okay so that's all three in a line so to start with look at the display ones you can see hardly anything there you can't really feel it and to be honest it cut through it really really nicely no problem at all so now we've got this is the master tools cutters and again hardly anything there's a tiny little bit more than the display ones i'll be honest with you but it cut through it absolutely beautiful no real problems with those there and then last up we got some of the mr hobby ones and again hardly anything there to be honest i would you'd be hard pressed to know the difference between all three of these cutting wise and again just a tiny little bit left on there so again you can probably or hopefully see if i do this somewhat in a good way you can hardly see any difference between those. It's not like they've got a huge tab hanging out the end of it. It's not like, you know, obviously if we tried it with a pair of these. So as you can see, you've got a slight tab on the end and you've got a slight tab on the end. But also the thing is when you look at it, it's got white 
and that's because it's got the pressure cut because it's got two so if you're thinking that all cutters are the same trust me until you've used a single blade one you'll know about it but there you go again you're looking at a measly so these particular blades here are these ones so these are the 09990 high quality single blade cutters 16 quid 16 quid so you're literally looking at 16 pounds for something that does pretty much the same as the display ones now okay they don't cut exactly the same the one thing i can't show you here is how it feels as it cuts through to be honest with you, the display ones are really nice. They cut through fantastically well. They're not as nice as obviously the God Hands ones because the God Hand ones are lethally sharp for one. Secondly, the blade is incredibly thin, so it cuts through no problem at all. But I have to say, I can't really feel that much difference. It's just a little bit nicer. So in that way, you've got that thing. The Hobby Boss ones, I think, cut quite chunky. They're not quite as obviously as sharp. I think the Master Tool ones are probably a nicer cut. Then you would obviously go to your display ones and then obviously you're looking at your God hands purely because the blade is very, very sharp and it just goes through. Display ones, very, very nice. But again, you're into that realm of the three, but that's where pricing comes up. For what it does, honestly, I'd be hard pushed to tell between the actual uh, Master Tool one and obviously the display cutters, they're very, very close. Now, the other thing as well I can't say is how long they're gonna stay like this. I don't know how long they're gonna stay as sharp as it. I'll play with it over the next couple of months and we'll see how we'll go. What I will say though is, and again, this is where you know, you've got this things, the God Hands ones have a habit of breaking. The blade is very, very fine. It doesn't like dealing with stiff plastic. And if you go any more than one mil, or one and a half mil, you're risking breaking your blades. They are what we call a precision tool. So definitely it's one of those that you use it pretty much for best, and that's what I do, and on very, very fine parts that I don't want to do cleanup with. For daily runners, though, I think we're into this realm, okay? So, yeah, the display ones, you know, I love them. I think they're fantastic, no problem at all. I can honestly now say the Master Tool ones for half the price of the display ones at £16, they are great. They feel very, very nice in the hands. The, the reach of it and the distance, you can probably see the display ones are a little bit more, and again, even more. So if you wanted to, you would say those are the widest, then you've got these, and then you've got these. And I know a lot of people say about how they're comfortable in the hands. These ones are very comfortable in the hands. The springs feels very nice. So yeah, no problem at all with it. But honestly, my honest review on these ones is they're really good. And I think for the money, I'd use them all day long. Yeah, literally, it'd be one of these things. Even if I broke a pair every six months, it's still a good tool and value for money, and it cuts very, very well. Just the last thing to talk about is probably to look on the back side. You can probably see that the blade is a little bit smaller. That's all we're going to say really on this than the actual... Uh, the, the display ones. You can see the actual jaws are a little bit smaller. And then again, if you put it up to these ones, you can probably see on the back side the sharpness... Uh, points on them if I can close them all up some way there we go you can probably see that the actual um, these ones here should have it the other way up really to show obviously the ones we're looking at the master tool you can see the jaw size is quite small okay when you compare it to the other two obviously the display um, Mr. Hobby ones down in here you can probably see they've got slightly bigger mouths but again the display one's got the biggest of all three okay on there so that's maybe a little factor as well as you're thinking about how to get this in but generally for any type of modeling work highly highly recommended on that one i think they're absolutely fantastic and again for the money it's a no-brainer absolute no-brainer on that one so there we go that's the tools for this week i have to say some really really good ones down in there and again some of the ones these look cheap and nasty and everything but actually it's probably a good one to have in your set purely because if you ever need to do any very fine saw work razor saw work and everything else and perhaps you haven't got things like uh, these ones down in here uh, i think this is the jlc as it saw and again we've got some aftermarket cmk blades in it things like that razor blade saws really very very nice but again generally for just ones like these for having perhaps if you're coming back to the hobby new to the hobby they're quite handy just to have kicking around and make your way through and again for the money you're not going to break your bank these particular ones again no problem at all for the punch set i think they're very very nice it's a nice little system it's one of those tools it's very handy to have purely because if you've got one 
you know, it's easy. You just go over, it'd be one of those tools you maybe use once a year, but you've got one and you've got all the sizes down into there, which is really good and so handy tool to have. And again, isn't gonna massively break the bank. Star show for me though, is a single blade nipper blades as they call them. These are absolutely fantastic on these. So your part number for this one is 09990. Really very, very good indeed. I have to say a real good buy for those ones, especially at the price where you're talking. Okay, as it's Tuesday, it is Q&A day, so let's do some of your questions from this week. First of all, we got Donald. He says, hi Phil, I'm currently working on the Horizon Models Mercury Redstone at 172nd. Might remember I reviewed that not so long ago. A beautiful kit. Uh, I've constructed most of the boosters uh, and I've got the primary coat on. Since the model is moulded in grey, I decided to use Tamiya's White Find Surface Primer. Beautiful stuff highly recommend that. Uh, the primer has left a very nice, very smooth satin finish that I quite like. Since the booster is mostly white, is there any point in spraying another coat of flat white over the primer, only to have it lay down a gloss coat over the entire thing? The final plate, I'll paragraph it because you've got a little bit on this one. Absolutely. To be honest, it's exactly what I did to my one as well. So what I've done in the past is literally gone through, used a white primer, primer looks good I might put a clear coat of a satin finish or even a gloss over that said finish because again that particular primer is incredibly fine it gives a very nice smooth finish so honestly if it's white I can't see the point of putting white over white just for the sake of it when it's already there so I would actually clear coat over the top of it and away you go He's put, after very light wet sanding, the primer seems smooth enough for decals. Can I just leave it on the primer uh, as my color coat or is there something I'm missing? Absolutely not. Remember, my rule of thumb is always do it the easiest way possible. There's no point making work for yourself. So if you're happy with it, literally, I would decal straight onto it and treat it. Because don't forget, primers technically are just another coat of paint at the end of the day. Yes, sometimes they've got a little bit more bite to them. They adhere better onto surfaces because that's what they're designed to do. But normal ones out there, especially from a hobby point of view, it's absolutely fine to use it. And I do it all the time. And certain manufacturers, and I think Vallejo, in fact, I've got one here. This is one of their surface primers, which is a US Navy Light Ghost, which is actually called Surface Primer, which is FS36375. Exactly the same thing, no problem at all. So yes, go for it, you'll be fine. But yes, for the price of a Starbucks every month, um, uh, it sure is great to have access to Philip Floyd Encyclopedia of Modeling Knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely, a true bargain for any serious modeler. Thank you, Donald, your checks in the post. Uh, Chris has put, hi Matt, I uh, couldn't get them to post a live chat. Well, as you can see here, it can post on here either. And I don't know what you're talking about, Chris, to be honest. So sorry about that. Uh, Christopher says, hi Phil, on the Tuesday night show on the 2nd of the 10th, or because you're an American, that'd be the other way around, 10th of the 12th even, uh, you mentioned soldering using a product that you brush on and apply with heat. Is this product a mix of flux uh, and filler material? Can you also explain the process? Um, uh, is it appropriate for joining a large pieces of photo etch, uh, which you would use the torch? Yeah, so what this stuff is, I've done videos on this, um, Star Destroyer, we used it for all the soldering. As you might know, I'm not very good with photo etch and I am not very good with electrics or soldering or anything else like that. So this stuff is an absolute, if I get this to come up, is an absolute no brainer. So it's called Mechanics Soldering Paste. You can see the things down in there about it, okay? It is, um, to be honest, I've had my donkey's year so it's gone a little bit off now, but it is literally like this, okay? You brush it on, or you take it out and brush it on whatever you want. So if you wanted to do a little bit of um, photo etch work, what I would do is just brush it into that area and then away you go. I've got a tiny little blowtorch, which to be honest is out of gas at the moment, uh, and it does one of these tiny little flames, blue flame, and then you just zip across it and it will instantly melt it, take the heat off, and then it sets it rock hard. It's great. It's really, really handy for doing it. It's also great for electric. So like me, if you're not very good with it, I just twist the wires together, I put a little bit of paste over it, and then we just hit it with the blowtorch, and then instantly it turns to silver, and then you take the heat off, and obviously it sets and it's rock hard. You've got a perfect join for soldering and stuff like that. I'm not very good with the wire and trying to solder and go along with flux and all of that. So this technically, I think it's got flux and everything all in one. So it is very, very good. It weighs an absolute ton. It's like a lump of lead, this stuff. So um, yes, it's got lots of things in there. But no, really, really handy type stuff. So have a look at for that. It's literally called Mechanic Soldering Paste. 
Uh, very, very nice. I think I got mine off of eBay uh, and away you go. So yes, good job on that one. Um, Alan says, uh, hi Phil, I'm not going to start the Kitty Hawk MHL, sorry, I'm going to start the MH, uh, Kitty Hawk MH60L shortly and looking at the resin main rotor hub. Uh, is it suitable for the kit parts? However, uh, on the face of it, the kit parts don't look too bad. Uh, I don't know if it's worth all the effort of thoughts. Um, again, to be honest, I've got this one apart, which I haven't put in my stash yet, but I'm planning on doing this one obviously next year and I'm gonna fold mine up completely. So I'm, I am aware, purely because I had all the kits here, but not long enough, but some of them come with a folded up hub and then obviously all the little stanchions and things to hold the rotors and then you fold the tail up and everything. The S860B does, some of the other ones don't, but honestly, have a good look at the instructions because the instructions are absolutely terrible, Kitty Hawk, um, and it doesn't show it at all. So it doesn't show you how it all folds up, but all the parts are in there. I am aware, as you said before, there is a resin aftermarket all done in one and just add the blades to it, hub for it, but I'm probably gonna have a go myself uh, and try and fold it up and all the rest of it. So again, it won't take up much room. It's not like usual helicopters. And to be honest, it looks quite nice folded up these things anyway. So you might wanna follow along with me in a few months time when I get going with this particular kit. Um, because again, they do look very, very nice. But I do know some of them don't come with those parts. So have a look at your kit and just make sure it does come with the parts that can hold all the blades up if it's folded. And if you are doing it just normal, I would probably keep with the kit parts. Although the instructions are really, really bad, the parts are all there for it. And it is said before, it doesn't look too bad either. So I'd probably give uh, a bit of a go with it. Uh, John says, hi, Phil. Uh, I'm looking to fade the decal on the wall. Uh, so it looked like it'd been aged painted advert. What is the best way to doing this? Very nice as well. Okay, so there's a couple of ways of doing it. Obviously flat coat it um, all the way over it and then you can just fade it with things like buff and stuff like that. And again, depending on how it is attached to that wall, you can dry brush and you could give natural weathering to it. You could sand lightly through it as well to fade it through, depending again how it's printed. If it's white underneath, you could just literally sand it a little bit, use very fine sanders, stuff like that to sort of, you know, bring it back. You've got some marks on the wall where you've got that wall brace coming through um, and you could obviously, you know, go through and show the brace. So it looks like it's literally just worn through those areas, stuff like that, the edges, make and tatty um, hitting them literally with a knife or with like cocktail sticks and stuff like that and scratching them and all those types of things as well to come away there's lots of different ways to it my personal favorites literally is to sand it very very lightly and you can just take the edge off of it but also like uh, buff you know thinned buff paint over the top will age anything and just make it fade into its background color and again you know you could do whatever color you've done with with the wall um, and you know very very thin coat and you can build it up very slowly to make it look like it's aging into it uh, and stuff like that but again you could go the other way you could then weather it you could put watermarks onto it so you know oils neat oils and then dragging you know to give that sort of worn down effect you've got that brickwork on the top of it stuff like that so you might want to take some things from that as if it's come down and you know worn into it it is one of those things it's like artistic flair you know you could go really really worn so it's literally hanging off or you could go to that thing of saying you know it, it hasn't been up that that long you know so personally i would just go with a little bit of dry brushing you know just those things as well knock it all off use oils for dry brushing is beautiful and that type of thing and you can fade with it as well again it's one of those it's probably you might overthink it a little bit but it's just your standard type of weathering how you do everything else like you've done on the bottom of your wall there and everything else you're just going to do that higher up and just put it onto it so you've got that aged effect to it and things like that but again washes clay washes that will grip to it if you've got like a textured finish onto it like a satin finish it will help eat into that and it will just darken it down and stuff so literally just treat it like the wall uh, and just go right the way over it and you'll be absolutely fine looks good also bony points for the uh, background uh, Al says, uh, hi Phil, joined back in September and have enjoyed the shows uh, with the team. My mug arrived safely last week uh, and my P47 Razorback Thunderbolt arrived next day from PM Store. Good job. Uh, I have a question. I sprayed gloss coat onto my model and let it dry for about five days uh, and went to de uh, Decal and found I got a fingerprint in my model. The gloss coat uh, sorry, uh, what gloss coat do you uh, use and how long do you leave it to dry? 
Um, glosses have been using H30 from Mr. Hobby. I had the same problem with Tamiya X22. In both cases, I did a 50-50 mix with leveling thinner. Sorry for being long-winded, not at all, Alan. Uh, to be honest with you, that does seem really, really excessive. That does seem like it's taken a age to dry. Normally 24 hours, I say you'll be absolutely fine. But if you've been doing it five days later, then yeah, that's not good. The only thing I would say is that has it got trapped? And I talk about this a lot. When I say trapped, what's happened is, is that you know, you've got your painted coat down, you've put on your gloss, you let it dry, you can get a second coat, maybe a third coat to get a really nice gloss finish has the coat underside dried off? Because what happens is you get the eggshell effect. So what I mean by that is that top coat's dried because it's air drying. The ones underneath haven't. So when you hold it, what happens is the heat from your hand slightly softens that top coat. And then obviously the coat from underside reactivates with it and you end up with a fingerprint. Now normally that's like a 24 hour thing and 48 maybe tops. I've never heard of it after five days but that's maybe what it is. Also, if your gloss coat is really thick, it's gonna take forever, because think about it taking ages to dry off and to get out and for the gases to escape. And that's the only trouble with using a normal single pack paint or an air drying paint. If you're using a two pack, you know, that's a chemical reaction. So it goes off, it heats, and then it goes off. Doesn't matter what it is, okay? But if you're using singles, like most of us are with a hobby, you have gotta allow for each layer to dry. And that's why I often talk about thin layers. Put down a thin layer, let that dry for half an hour. Put down a nice thin layer, let it dry for half an hour. Final one, a little bit thicker, let it dry off for a day. Because they've all had time to dry off. But if you've got thick coat, thick coat, thick coat, it can trap. And if it traps, it just takes forever to get going. Sometimes it can't even. We often talk about the eggshell effect cracking. So some people say, why is my top coat gone all cracked? It's because the undercoats aren't dry. And it's literally like a surface and as it's drying off and things like that, it cracks and it breaks and it literally has, gives you lots of trouble. Hello, Molly the dog, who's just bolted to open the door and came in. Okay, next up we've got Daniel. He says, hi Phil and team, I'm building the monogram 148 scale B24D and I decided to give the World War II Africa desert scheme. After a lot of research on the net, um, I'm not quite sure what color to use. Sometimes it looks quite pinky and other times it looks more yellow. Um, I'm asking for your suggestion. I have MRP guns color range in my stash. Regards from Germany. Hello, Daniel. Um, listen, it's one of those things. It's um, Strawberry Bit a Bitch, which is obviously quite a famous B24 Liberator. I had the Hasegawa version of it many years ago when it first came out. It's really pinky. And then I was looking at references and you look more this, more sandy color. So again, it's one of those things. And then I found a lot of reference photos. And the trouble I found was that a lot of the reference photos look colored and then I'd find the black and white version. And then I'm thinking, has somebody recolored the photos, uh, you know, after the, the, the event? And that's what it is, that in that form, it always looks too pink. I would go for a more sandy type of color than the pink colors that are out there. I've got them as well. Uh, I've got the MRPs over there and I have got that color in amongst it as well. It may be one of those things where in weathering, you can weather it down a little bit. So by giving it weathering washes and oils and perhaps filters and stuff like that, you can change the hue of the color. Like this thing at the moment looks really light. By the time I finished it, it'll look a lot darker. So it may be working that way as well. I'm not, I must admit, up on this color too much. I, probably you can tell. But we often talk about this with the REF color as well. Because the REF color, if you look at sometimes it's really pink. In other times it looks more sandy. It's in that realm. It's that type of color. It's very, very difficult to know which way to go with it. Personally, and this is one of those ones I often say a lot, go with what you feel looks right. So perhaps do some color swatches, you know, put it on a bit of plastic card, an old bit of whatever, okay? Have a look at them and think, do you know what? I want that color and then stick with it. Don't be put off by what everyone else says. Oh, it should be pink, it should be this. Because honestly, if you look at the photos, they're all over the place as well, because I remember doing mine. Uh, and it, you, know, you end up thinking to yourself, you know, what's right, what's wrong, you don't know. And you know, you can end up with all these different problems. So I would say color swatch it, Right, I'm gonna go with that, that's what I'm gonna go for. But also, you know, you probably see on this one, the bonnet's different color to the body, yet it's the same color. That's because I was a lot nicer with this one. So think of it in the great scheme of things as well. Things weather, as they weather, they get lighter. You know, so that pink color might fade and go more sandy color, various things like that. So honestly, I would just go with whichever one suits you best 
and go for that. It's probably a question we can bring over as well to the Thursday show with me and the guys and get their opinion on it as well. But yeah, I would say stick with what you feel is right for you and then just go for it. Uh, last one, Samuel says, hi Phil, I've been using the new Tamiya Lacquer LP9. LP9, I have LP9, there's LP9. Um, uh, and I was using it on small parts as landing gear, doors, etc., and it worked absolutely perfectly. Uh, I've just used it on a fuselage on my 72nd Hercules, all over the same paint as the doors, with this, exactly the same mix, 50-50 uh, self-leveling thinners. When I sprayed it over the fuselage, it's turned chalky and white. Uh, while on the small parts it's absolutely fine. Any ideas might be going on and would you recommend just polishing the fuselage back to get rid of the chalky white coat? Okay now the chalky white coat we've spoken about this before there's actually a video on this as well. What can happen is if you're spraying at a high air pressure it dries en route to the model okay and what I'm thinking is when you're doing doors you're probably doing small bits so you're very much like this and you've got it on and they're quite wet and away you go okay but when you've turned around to do the big model and we're all guilty of it so you know you'd be spraying these like these and you're all good you're probably this far away when you're on to big stuff you tend to be okay we're gonna put this down and you know say I do it as well what's happening is it's drying on the way to the model this frostiness you're talking about is particles stacking so the particles are coming through the air they're drying out because you're further away and you've got your air pressure pushing it on by the time you get to the surface they stick think of it like snow okay so new analogy this is one of the ones i thought about the other day and i was like i should have mentioned it i can do it today when it's raining the wet just splats onto itself doesn't it and it melts into the the rain underneath and you end up with a really shiny, glossy surface, you know, with wet, and it's like a mirror. Think of it like snow hitting it. Because the particles are now dry, when they touch each other, they're stacking on top of each other. So when you look across snow, it looks flat. And that's the trouble, and that's what's happening. A couple of things you can do. Just give it a rub. It may be enough to get rid of it. The other way you can actually do it is actually put another coat that's a little bit more wetter. So if you're further away, make it wetter, a little bit more thinners. But honestly, your best thing to do is just to move closer. So instead of treating your model, and let's face it, Hercules is a big old lump at the best of days. It's probably this big, okay? Instead of sort of treating it as one, treat it in sections. Because it won't hurt either, because it's great for weathering. But do a nose. So, and you know, the cockpit area, then do the mid, then do the wings, break the wings up, perhaps into a center section of the wings and then outers, and then the back and the tail and treat each area. Instead of trying to do it all as one, just go, we're gonna do this area, then we're gonna move down here, then we're gonna do up here, so forth and so on, and that should really cue your problem. But getting rid of it, try and give it a rub first, because sometimes that works. Secondly, give it a rub, then just give it another coat, but break it up in areas. But just think of it as stacking, like snowflakes falling on a surface, you know, frost building, up because that's literally what you're doing at the end of the day so it's just one of those easy things to do just like that anyway that's about it for me i waffled on far too long and i've got to edit this lot together so anyway i'll be back with you tomorrow um afternoon with matt it's not a live show it's recorded so obviously if you've got any questions please get them up to us by uh one o'clock and we can answer them on the pm show tomorrow me and the guys will be back with you on thursday night 7 30 with a live show and obviously in the chat room and then on friday obviously we'll get the next part of the m wrap up might even get a little bit of a start if we can actually on the enterprise as well it should be quite nice to make our way through it's been great back doing tall tuesday and doing a few things like this hopefully they'll be back with you in the new year we'll be doing lots more stuff as we take on more product lines with pm store and stuff like that i can showcase them and obviously have a bit of a test run with you here but if you have looked at any of these and you think i'd like those don't forget we've got them all in stock at the moment with the pm store if we haven't we've got new stocks coming in daily so just keep an eye on the site as we make our way through anyway that's it from me happy modeling take care i'll see you soon